Oh, my. Yes, a blast in the past. All that and more coming up in the Super Bowl service. Uh, you know what? Why do we do that? Why? Why? Because we like to have fun, actually. And uh, we, we always are trying to improve the Super Bowl stuff. Sometimes we go a little too far making changes. This, next, this year, we're going to kind of step back to some things we eliminated last year. We always want to make it better and more and more fun. And why are we going to have a time that's just fun, and not just fun. I say just fun. There's also meaning, significant, profound meaning. It's because our culture is so divided, and the Super Bowl is the one holiday, no matter what your political opinion, no matter what your religious affiliation, it's the one holiday every, every American can celebrate or be a part of. And this is actually my first uh, f- entire game I've watched all NFL season. I haven't watched a full game since the last Super Bowl. And in fact, I didn't watch it the last year either. Why? Because I'm so fed up with my hometown team. I just kind of lost interest in the NFL entirely. But I watch the Super Bowl every single year. And so I can't wait for this. It's going to be a lot, a lot of fun. I, I, I'd love to get back on the Super Bowl train next year, maybe next year. But just right now, i, I got other better uh, things to do. But it's going to be an amazing weekend. You're going to want to bring your friends. You're going to want to be engaged and uh, see how, who has mimosas at tailgating or whatever they have. It is good, good stuff. So in the midst of our contention society, we are a society that needs to have some peace. And that's what we're going to talk about in week three of how not to be a jerk face. Let's pray before I, I do that. Father, I know that uh, you value our time too much to waste it. And whenever your word is brought, whenever your truth is brought, nothing is wasted. And I'm praying that happens today, that your truth not only is spoken out of my mouth, but is received in our ears and it is retained in our hearts. Help this to be a time of clarity for us and also maybe a time for a new direction for others. You're good to give us this time today. Use it to the fullest. And I pray these things according to the character and identity of Jesus. Amen. Matthew 5, 9, classic sermon by Jesus, known as the Sermon on the Mount. One little snippet. Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. He doesn't say blessed are the peacekeepers. These are two entirely different ideas. Today, We want to keep the peace, but that's different than being a peacemaker. Being a peacekeeper is when you're at the holidays and you know certain things you could say are going to set people off, and so you make sure those things aren't said. (laughs) Being a peacekeeper means if someone is a little upset, you say whatever you can to buff it over because you don't want everyone to have a bad day. And there's a time and place for buffing things over, but being a peacekeeper never leads to substantive life change. It never leads to, to great relationships. But being a peacemaker is an entirely thing. This is when you go on the offensive to help people get along. It's when you and I go on the offensive to try to get rid of some of the conflict in our culture. And when Jesus says this, he doesn't promise that your life will be better. It's not blessed with peacemakers because everyone knows it works out better for you. <laughs> no, he tells us to be peacekeepers because to be a peace, excuse me, he tells them to be peacemakers because to be a peacemaker is hard and it's difficult and it can tie your stomach up in knots. Jesus calls you and I to a life that takes action, never avoids. When you're a peacemaker, you take action. When you're a peacemaker, you avoid it. When you're a peace maker, you take action. When you're a peacekeeper, you avoid it. And Jesus never calls us to avoid. I'm getting peacemaker and peace taker. Teaker, pe- I'm really getting that mixed up here today. My gosh. Maker, taker, meeker, miker, whatever the heck is. You know what I'm saying. Jeez. No, no, no. Now I'm saying I'm going, wait a minute. Did I just say that right in the last sentence? Or I say it wrong? Uh, you know what I'm saying. Who, knows, who does not know what I'm saying? Keeping the peace is when you try to be mellow and passive. Being a peacemaker is when you're aggressive. Jesus, we took communion today. Jesus, when he took communion, it was the ultimate example of being a peacemaker. He made peace because if your problems, my problems, your rebellions, my rebellions, your sin, my sin, there was a separation gap between us and God. And when Jesus goes to the cross, which is what communion is about, when he breaks his body and spills his blood and goes open on a cross, 
He makes the possibility for peace. Peace with you and peace with me, with God. He was the ultimate peace, and it hurt him. One of the things I love about the Bible is it never tells us if you do everything right, then you're never going to have a problem. Never tells us that. One thing I love about the Bible, it never tells us if you're just a nice person, then only nice things will happen to you. It never tells us. In fact, Jesus says exactly the opposite sometimes. That when you do the right thing, you will be persecuted. The Bible and Jesus' teachings is a book of reality. And there's a reason why many of us are not peacemakers doing aggressive things to bring peace. Because it hurts. Because people make mistakes in understanding who we are. It's rough. This last Christmas, uh, Lib and I, as normal, had a bunch of people over our house, extended family and such. And when we had people over, uh, we have a bit of an eclectic family. We've got people who lean to the right. We have people who lean to the left. We have people who have a more traditional Christian background. We have people uh, who have, a, who have a, a Muslim background. We have people who are just have general spirituality background. So kind of all over the map. And it's, and it's really great. We, we have a great time with these extended family and our house being jammed to full. It's, it's, it's really good. So one day... Uh, most of the people, uh, there, there was some of us who were in the kitchen and somehow we started getting into some contentious topics and difficult things to talk about. And, and it was going in and I, and I noticed that the people who might have trended towards my viewpoint on things weren't there. So like I was alone. And so no problem, that's fine. So I feel alone a lot of times actually with things I believe. So I'm like <laughs> sitting there and I'm like, you know, we're talking and, and, and all of a sudden uh, someone goes, Anyone who believes that must be an idiot. I'm like, I guess that would be me. <laughs> and um, and the topic, I think the topic at that point was, uh, was uh, a pro-life stuff because I'm, I'm adopted. I'm adopted. And so I, I said, this, look, I'm, I'm adopted. So the reason why I think abortion is not a good idea is because I'm glad someone didn't abort me because I could have, should have been aborted. But I wasn't. So that's why that topic kind of means a lot to me. I was like, hmm. And then all of a sudden, like the people are trying to understand. And then someone said, "So are you a single? Are you a single issue voter? I mean, do I only vote for people who are pro-life?" So, no, I, I, I would vote for somebody who isn't. I mean, that's not, we had this good, interesting dialogue uh, uh, about the whole thing. And in the midst of that, afterwards, like it was very contentious. And then afterwards, like we're, we're all spending time, like making you, you feeling okay, mom feeling okay. There's texts that are going back and forth afterwards. Stuff. It was really a beautiful thing as people were, were making peace in the midst of very contentious discussions sometimes on a variety of issues. People were making peace. Now, I, I wasn't offended at all by what was said to me in that situation. It's because all of us should be used to being offended in our culture. <laughs> America culture has become increasingly, increasingly offensive. That is, if you get outside of the little pocket of people that you have as acquaintances, as friends, as social media partners, because those pockets are always people who think like you and I, talk like you and I, process like you and I. And one of the things I said in the midst of this conversation, I said, so what, whatever happened to recognizing that we have different beliefs, but I like you, you're a good person. I said, why do we have to demonize people who have different beliefs anymore? Well, I don't understand that. Can we not see that we, have, we see the world differently? We have different perspectives? That doesn't mean I can't like you or love you, but we've lost that ability as a culture. In large part, it's because we become very, very segmented by by social media. The New York Times recently said this. Psychologists and other social scientists have repeatedly shown that when confronted with diverse information choices, people rarely act like rational, civic-minded automatons. Instead, we are roiled by preconceptions and biases, and we usually do what feels easiest. We gorge on information that confirms our ideas, and we shun what does not. As I was preparing for this, thinking about this, I kept thinking about things in my mind that were 
put there and were rolling around because a friend of mine had said a while ago, and I've pondered it very frequently, so I thought, well, I'm going to slip that little insight in here. And I, as I was thinking about this, I thought, hmm, instead of actually slipping that little insight in here or there, maybe I'll just get straight from the horse's mouth. Not to call him a horse, but maybe we'll just get straight from him. So that's exactly what we're going to do. Please welcome my friend and Crossroads member, Tim Shiggle, to our stage. Come on up, Tim. Now, as, as Tim makes his way up, um, you probably don't know him at all, but you, everyone in here does know or has used a piece of his work. Hello, Tim. Good to see you. Right. Uh, have you ever gone to the website? Anyone ever gone to this thing called the World Wide Web? Anyone ever gone there before? Anyone, anyone, anyone ever gone there and seen a page that looks kind of like this? And uh, as you look at a page, uh, if you look a little closer, there's this little thing that looks like this, these three little dots. What do you do when you're doing that? You're sharing this. What are you doing? You're sharing this. Right. Share, yeah. Yeah. That's Tim's company. Tim invented that symbol, and that's his company, Share This. So, yes, the most interesting man no one's ever heard of. Very fascinating. Let's so, keep it that way. Yeah, let's absolutely keep it that Being way. Being on this stage probably doesn't help. But, uh... <laughs> that's exactly right. So... To take us way back to the founding of the internet when you and Al Gore invented it. What happened way back <laughs> right, when? Right, what was, right, that, what right, was right. that all about? He was anti-sharing and I was pro-sharing. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, uh, so I had been involved in the tech industry and you know, the internet was growing. Google was, was uh, you know, a behemoth, right? Everything we found, we found through Google and um, we were just inundated with information. And I started investigating this and saw that uh, we, people were having a hard time dealing with that, right? And so I did some focus groups and some research. And uh, in one research session, it was, it was interesting. I asked people how they found new information. And, and actually, to our surprise, they said it wasn't through search. And they actually knew that search was gamed, you know, Google's game. People pay for that. And I said, well, how do you find information? And they said, well, from links people share with me. And that was the moment when the light bulb went off, mm. uh, the epiphany. And I thought, I do that all the time. I share links. I receive links from people. And so uh, people realize that in order to make sense of all this information, they rely on friends, experts, friends, trusted sources to get information. And nobody tracked it, which was amazing. So I started talking to analysts and researchers and said, do you know how many times people share things every day? And no one had the answer. And I knew, based on my experience and the experience of other people, that it happened all the time. So share this happened. And, and yet, as we share things, you had a stunning statistic on how many of us actually read the thing that we share. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. not to read the thing that got shared with us, but read the thing that we share. Right. People are sharing. So, I thought when it was creating Share This that this was going to be helpful to people, right, in terms of finding information because I like the stuff that you share with me. Well, it turns out uh, about three quarters of the time, 67% of the time, people will share a link before even reading the article. Right? <laughs> Which, and I said, why? Actually, actually why I, would you, I do that sometimes. Well, why would you do that? <laughs> why, why would someone do that? Well, they see the title. <clears throat> the title. The titles are designed, you know, to get your attention, to get you to share. As a matter of fact, to share this, we actually help publishers figure out how to make articles shareable. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the so we get we kind of help with that. But it, um, it's actually it's, psychologists call it confirmation bias, mm. right? We we so we like to click on things and read things that support our worldview of things. So. Yeah, so one the, what you told me a while ago that has been so fascinating to me was your belief or the experts' beliefs way, way back when of what the internet would do and what it's actually done. So go back. What, what was the utopia, beautiful vision for the internet or the expectations right. for it? So the original idea was this concept of hyperlinking, right? You'd hyperlink to information so you can jump from article to article to article, and that would be a beautiful thing because it would create all this, you know, you'd, you'd see more points of view, you'd see diversity of thought, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the opposite happened. Basically, uh, almost any kind of topic you can choose, there's a bigger red and blue or a bigger black and white, uh, a pro and a con on almost everything. So what happens is actually more of a snowball effect. Because of the confirmation bias, because people are sending uh, uh, their, their, their same ideas around, it, it builds a snowball of some of those ideas and you actually get less diverse thinking. So the thought was, we hear people talk about this all the time, education is key, education is key. And so we thought that the internet was going to be just beautiful, free education, information available for the masses, anyone can get it. And so therefore, all ships should rise as the harbor rises, our intelligence will go up as, as, 
as culture, our, 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 our understanding of one another, and exactly the opposite, because now we're only understanding and interacting with people who are self-selecting into certain algorithms. And the system works against you. So the whole internet is designed from a business standpoint, if you're a publisher, to get people to click, for eyeballs, for clicks, clickbait, if you've ever heard that term, clickbait. Clickbait is rubbernecking, is watching traffic accidents, right? The news knows this. If they can keep you in a state of hysteria and, and going nuts, they get more clicks and they get paid more. So not only are we doing it to ourselves, but the system is designed that way to, to go after stories and uh, things that you will share and promote and go crazy over. This, this is probably not new information for any of us, but what's important for us to understand is this world that we live in, this contributes to why we are so conflict heavy to why we have such a bad time getting along with people who are different than us. Why all those jerk faces out there are who they are because we don't understand them. So as a, as a follower of Jesus, by the way, you're blaming the internet. You're, 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 you're more to blame than any of us are in here for any of the problems of the internet. Um. <laughs> jerk, jerk, jerk face. Jerk face uh. So um, what, what's, how... how so how do you interact with the internet differently? What's, what's some of your, your, your personal uh, spiritual rules? Do you have any as far as conflict, relationships, managing technology, social media? Just talk about that. Sure. So uh, first of all, you know, we, we, uh, we studied all these different channels of communication, right? So you have in person, you have telephone, you have email, you have texting, chat, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera, right? So you have this whole spectrum of communications. And the farther you go this way, to uh, being anonymous, people will say anything, right? Because they're not, they're not held accountable. Um, you lose empathy. You lose the ability to convey sarcasm. So we become more and more tone deaf when that, when that happens. Um, and so uh, it gets harder to communicate. And matter of fact, we're not communicating at this end. We're just posting, right? We're instigating. We're becoming mobs. We're not communicating. So uh, when, when, if, if, if I see somebody that sends me an email and is upset about something... I typically don't answer it, unless it's something just a very simple answer. I, I, I go talk to them. What? Yeah, I, it's true. Wait, 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 wait. You're, you're telling me that if you're upset by some, something someone said, you would go talk to them? Or I'll send my assistant. Okay, all right, uh, I, I understand that. But <laughs> no, the, the, there's no, I don't know of any substitute for it. So far, everything I've read pretty much shows that as you go on the spectrum, it makes conflict resolution harder. It is not easier. We can't deal with it. Uh, the speed of communication is so fast. And the other thing that's happening is, uh, as you do these different channels, think about it. Who, what's your motivation, right? Because these channels are public, right? This, this conversation is public. But if I call you up on the phone or go over your house, it's private, right? We're going we're gonna to relate differently. We're not relating out here. We're advertising. We're advertising for ourselves. Uh, we did a study early on. Uh, we commissioned a research study on these forms of sharing. And what was interesting is we found eight different motivations. And the number one, when you ask people why they shared, it was for, it was for helpful reasons, altruistically. They said, I share article with Brian Tome because I think he might find this information useful. And it turns out a couple years later, New York Times did the same study and came to the same, you know, the same conclusions. So most of the, the, the reasons were, were, were selfish and then some are unselfish and the others were selfish. Turns out Facebook did a similar study on Facebook. It was the opposite. It was selfish reasons. People pr self-promote. Look how good I look. Like, I just want to show how smart I am or I want to sell you something. Mm. Right? That's no. not effective. No. Any... Final thought that you'd have us to think about this in this current culture and being a jerk face or not being a jerk face? Uh, yeah, just uh, you know, think about when you post. What's your motivation? What are you trying to accomplish? And if you're really trying to communicate, go sit down and talk to somebody. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Let's thank Tim for coming up. That was good, buddy. Man, now when he says that he actually goes and talks to the person... Where would he get this idea from? He would get this idea from Jesus. This is what Jesus says when he gives a classic play-by-play -play text book of how to deal with the jerk face. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 following. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. 
But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Man. Okay, so very, very end, Gentile tax collector. Before we even build that into me to say, Jesus is saying, I mean, these are like stereotypical people you don't want to be around in the first century, especially, specifically if you're a Jew. Gentiles and tax collectors. So there's sort of a building that happens here is Jesus looks at being a peacemaker or being a jerk face. Let's, let's parallel those two things together. Peacemakers or jerk faces. Number one, peacemakers go to the offender. Jerk faces avoid them. If you want to be a peacemaker, you go to. He says, if your brother sins against you, Jesus says, go, go to them. He doesn't say if your brother sins against you, sit around and be bitter until he wakes up and calls you and apologizes. That's what we do. Someone does something to us that shouldn't have been done to us. We just sit back and we're, we're stewing and we're bitter and we're upset and we're like, hey, 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 hey. did you hear what he did? Hey, 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 hey. I can't believe he did. Hey, 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 hey. And we just, we're just like upset about it. We're tweeting about it. We're doing, we're doing whatever we can. We, we just kind of fester on this. And Jesus says, hey, if someone's done something to you that's bothering you, go to them. Pick up the phone. Go interact with them. Walk over to them. Romans 14, 19 says, So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Man, pursue what makes for peace. Can we all just recognize that sending anonymous emails or anonymous letters never makes for peace? Never does that? Can we all just acknowledge? that building our base, a core base of people who think like us and hate other people, never makes peace. We know these things. It never makes peace. To make peace, we have to go to the person who's bothering us. Now, maybe they've been bothering us for a day or two days. Don't go to them then. Just see if you can get over it. Just see if you can sit on it and if this goes away and it's done. But after a while, like this, this is not, this is not going away. I can't. Then at some point, okay, all right. Just to make some peace, I need to go and I need to need to talk to this person. Man, as Tim said, reaching out personally to touch somebody and talk to somebody is a very, very rare attribute. And when you do, people will come away from that interaction thinking, Wow, that, that person is different. There's something of a depth, a, a substance to them that I appreciate. Uh, this last week, I um, decided to um, do a little advertising to try to drum up some interest in a series that we're doing. As you know, if you've been on CrossFit for last year or so, we've talked about doing more and more on-location teachings because in immersive environments, the, the, the scriptural point comes through much more so, I believe, than a person on a black stage. So we've been trying to do more and more of that. One of the ones that we're building for in the future that we've talked about is an adventure series, looking at the adventures that you have in your life keeping a marriage together, adventure of finding a, a spouse perhaps, the adventure of getting out of debt, the adventure of whatever it is, and equating those and, uh, on a bike trip out west. And so as you know, we're taking applications. Uh, by the way, if you apply to be a part of it, you can go to crossroads.net slash ADV if you applied. Good news is you don't have a lot of competition right now. So as uh, we've been getting uh, video submission stuff, I decided to post it on a, on a forum uh, that I frequent regularly, a national forum on adventure riding. And um, I, I, I'm a regular contributor there. And um, a lot of the guys there are thankful for me. They think I've saved their life because I invented a part that hundreds of them, ha of them have, and they think I've saved their life. So I, I have a pretty, pretty positive interaction on this forum. So I just, I just post this little link and say, hey, if you're looking for, a if you'd like to do a free trip and have a little adventure, you could do this if you don't have anything against God or something like that. And people were right away going, oh, this is interesting. Oh, well, fun. About 90% of the people were like that. 10% or 5% were really like, this is uh, inappropriate, should not be on here. I've heard of Crossroads. It's dead, dead, dead. You know, just like bad mouthing, and it's gone on this. And uh, so, what I do, I, I, I see these things that are pretty inflammatory. And so, what do I do? I don't have their phone number. So, I private message them. I go on to Facebook, say, hey, I understand you have some concerns about it. I'd love to talk to you about that. 
hear nothing back, more chatter in the public. No, oh, I can't believe we should, this post should be removed, all this kind of stuff. Meanwhile, all these people think I've saved their life. They're like chipping in for me. Like, I don't have to do anything, right? And um, send another one. Hey, not, not, nothing happens. Nothing happens. Now, I don't have to have that person respond personally, but I tell you what, if I want to make the peace, I have to use his personal of a reach out as I possibly can because I personally don't like to be at peace. I know that I can't be at peace with all people, but the Bible says so long as it depends on you, live in harmony with all people. In harmony with all people. You and I need to take a different tact than culture does that creates stressed out people who can't have empathy for anybody unlike them. Psychology Today says this. The recent rise of social media may also play a role in the drop in empathy. The ease of having friends online might make people more likely to just tune out when they don't feel like responding to others' problems. A behavior that could carry over offline. Add in the hyper-competitive atmosphere and inflated expectations of success, and you have a social environment that works against slowing down and listening to someone who needs a bit of sympathy. After this uh, Christmas uh, debate that I was having with some family members, the family left, and I was sad, sad to see them leave. The last person's people who left, they let Winston out to go do his business in our yard because they were packing up their car. And when they went to do that, they got busy backing up their car. And then next thing you know, Winston was gone. Winston's my, my dog, my 140-pound uh, dog who's just 140 pounds of stupid is what he is. He just, he's lovable. He's cute. All that kind of, I think he's cute anyway. And all of a sudden, he's gone. It's like, oh, my gosh. It's, it's 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the morning, something like that. And... Um, and see, I know he's not, he's not running away because running away, number one, would take too much energy to actually run. Two, two, he, he's not like smart enough to go, whoo, I'm out here. I should actually go get more freedom. He, he can't process that way, right? What happens is he goes out and starts sniffing things and then he gets like two houses away, I think. And then he just forgets how to get home. So he's been gone for like a half an hour. He's wandered off wherever. And uh, this just happened like two, two weeks earlier. Like we've had two of these things in the last uh, four weeks, which we haven't had one for like years, right? So I'm like, oh, we just had this thing. This is not a good deal. So I'm driving around for a half hour. Um, uh, I, I find this, this app thing that helps you connect with people in neighborhoods. I can't remember what it's called, but if you post on this thing, it gets to everybody in your neighborhood and, and people will hear about it and stuff. So I post on, I, I, I join it and I say, hey, I lost my dog, Winston, he's this and that. And so people are like, oh, I'll keep my eyes open. I'm, I'm like, oh, this is cool. This is social media at it, its best. People are like saying, I'm going to keep my eyes off for it. Oh, I, I, I had that happen to me once. So it was a hard thing. And I was like, oh, this is cool, right? Um, we end up, we end up uh, getting Winston uh, not, I don't know, an hour or so later, everything, everything was fine. He had his collar on and someone found him on the way to work and called him in. It was, it was a really good resolution. Now, the bad thing about all this, bad thing is now I'm on this app email thing. You guys know what I'm talking about? Do you have this thing? Now it's like, now it's, I really don't care if someone tipped over your garbage cans. Someone tipped over my garbage cans last night. Anyone see who it was? Uh, no, maybe the wind. I, I don't know. It's like, my gosh. So it's last week I get this beauty. Check this beauty out. It says, uh, dear lady with the lab, your dog pooped on my lawn and didn't clean it up. I am very disappointed in the lack of accountability this neighborhood has. Please come back and pick it up. No questions asked. Thanks, angry neighbor. Really? Really? I, I, you think about this. You're going like, okay, I, I understand another dog poops your yard. That's not a cool thing. My dog has done it to my next door neighbor, but that's Brian Wells many times. Who cares about his yard? <laughs> um, I, I, I understand it's not a cool thing. I, 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 get, I get it. But I'm, I'm just sitting there going, okay, what took place? He, he didn't go out and say, oh, poop. There's poop here. What kind of poop is this? Oh, that's a brown lab. That's, a, that's, bri that's brown lab poop. 
that's who it is. And, and, and who's his owner? He didn't go look around. <gasps> I see stiletto heel marks right here. Wait a minute, I'm deducing smell of brown lab and a, wo- a woman who walked her brown lab, pooped in my yard, and now she, no, what happened? I, 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 when I walk my dog, here's, how, here's what happens when a dog poops, right? First, he starts sniffing a lot. Then his tail goes like stiff. And then he like goes around and he's, he's trying to circle, try to get the right position. He, this guy's inside, he's got to be watching this. He's inside watching him, do, or him doing his deal, and, and he's here, and then the woman just kind of goes off. At any moment, any moment, he could have made peace. Any moment, open the door. Hey! No, 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 no. Please, not my yard. Go to Brian Wells' yard. He's on down the down. down. <laughs> he could have opened up the door after he's done, saw Walker and said, Excuse me, ma'am, excuse me. Um, I just want to say, I got it this time. I'll, I'll clip your dog, but I, man, I, I appreciate you didn't do that again. That's cool. How about this one? Ah, uh, man, man, this is even better. Hey, uh, miss, I've, I've got a bag in here. Would you like me to give it to you so you can pick, pick that up? Is that, is, that, is that okay? I mean, any, any one of those things would be more honorable. Any of them would be more peacekeeping. And less jerk face than that, right? But you know, we don't even think about this. Why? Because we don't know how to interact with people anymore. We don't know how to talk to people. We don't, we don't know how to do that in the slightest. And maybe that's why our culture is hurting so much. Maybe that's why our relationships are so broken. Maybe that's why our stomach enzymes are so out of control. Someone sent me an interesting resource of a book from Amazon. It's called The uh, A-Hole Survival Guide. Here's what this guy said in an interview. I'd prefer to say that we are at a moment, historically speaking, that could be called peak a-hole. All the well-documented forces that turn people into jerks are in place. Power imbalance, sleep deprivation, people who are overworked, overcrowded, and in a hurry. What we can say is that largely on account of social media, a-hole behavior and the ability to fight it are escalating in tandem. Be slow to label others as a-holes. Be quick to label yourself as one. Mm. Yes, I did censor that three-letter three letter word by just saying a-hole. I did that because I don't, I, I'm getting old, I'm getting soft. I just didn't want to deal with the emails. Not a big deal. <laughs> kids are not in here. They should be in kids' club. Not a big deal. I didn't want to deal with the emails. And that's the same reason why I chose to have this next person's language edited as well. Before I came to Crossroads, I knew God. And I grew up in a Christian household. I went to a Christian school. I went to church. But church was just a sham for making myself look good. So playing in the band, being really cool. I never felt close to God or I never felt like God was asking me to do anything different in my life. And so when I walked into Crossroads and I got challenged, that was the first time that I was actually challenged to follow God in some way. There's a lot of pressure to be the best, to look the best, to have your life together all the time. It's all about self-promotion and it's all about actually being the best. You know, so I was in school for music performance. So obviously I'm gonna have some performance issues. Anything that was helping me would work. So friendships, women, music, if it wasn't helping me, then I wouldn't have done it. It was the like average American jerk face. And I know we say like, you might be a jerk face if you park in the handicap spot. You know, like those are funny, sure, but you know a jerk face when you see it. But if you're a jerk face, you don't necessarily know it. So one day I stumbled into Crossroads and I thought, wow, there's a lot of people here. They probably want to hear me play music. I auditioned for the music team. Um, I got in, just barely. Not because I couldn't play, but because I was a jerk and I didn't know it. And so I got, uh, did my first weekend, and then the drummer Josh Surkamp, uh, who I thought was great, he texts me, he says, I want to hang out. And I think, wow, this is awesome. Josh wants to hang out with me. This is going to be so much fun. 
And so Josh meets me at Crossroads, he sits me down and he says, you're an asshole. And I just broke down crying. And that was the first time anybody had told me that. So it started on the weekends, Josh said, okay, I'm gonna just say what I think when you say something dumb. I'm just gonna tell you, don't, like, literally. So I would just be in the green room and he'd, he'd be, stop talking, David, just shut up. I didn't always know why he was calling me out. It was then, okay, what, what was that about? He's like, why were you doing that? Why were you saying that? There was a lot of the motivation that I didn't understand why I was doing what I was doing. I didn't really even know who I was. So I was just putting on this fake life. My worth was based on how well I was performing and how much I had accomplished and where I had played and what I had done. And turns out people just didn't like me because of that. And I didn't find that out until later that basically all the people that I thought were my friends really didn't like me. I wasn't like actively going out of my way to hurt people. I would have said I was a nice person and so after that time with Josh, that's when God started to peel off the layers. That journey isn't like an overnight. I wasn't just magically not a jerk face. And there's really, I don't know that there is a crossover point between like, oh, I was, I guess I can say that now, but it was just walking with God over time and not giving up when things were hard or I didn't understand and trusting that God had better things if I was willing to follow. So now I have a plan for my life. I have a purpose that's not self-preservation. And I'm just thankful that somebody said something to me. There's tons of guys out there who are just like me and who don't have anybody to tell them. Hi, I'm David and I used to be a jerk face and I'm still a jerk face. <laughs>、so、refreshing. It's really good. Next big idea is pe peacemakers speak honestly. Jerk faces mince words. I mean, Josh, when he just said, hey, look, you're an a hole, you get, you know, that was a very honest statement. And also in the context of, I'm not going anywhere. Josh, by the way, did that as part of his job. You know, if you're in employment anywhere, which hopefully you are, if you want to be, and you're a manager, And you feel like all you're doing is dealing with the jerk face you work with, in all likelihood, you are. At least 25 to 40% of every manager's time is spent dealing with workplace conflicts. 25 to 40% of the time. Every, bu every business over the country, in the whole country, we spend $359 billion in payments in terms of paychecks that we get that are being spent on dealing with conflicts. And jerk faces inside of our work. Here's the thing this isn't just a 2018 thing, this is a human thing. This is why Jesus talked about it as much as he did, because they had just as many issues, even if they didn't have social media, back in the first century. Jesus says in the book of John, chapter 13, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I've loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus says, Do you want to stand out as being a cut above? Operate in love. Do you want to stand out as being the kind of person that other people want to be around? Be a person of love. In fact, based on how you love people that other people tweet about, people go, That person must know God. That person must have a divine spirit inside. There's something about that person. They, Jesus says, you will, They will not know you're my disciples if you have the right beliefs. They will not know you're my disciples if you read the Bible every day. They will not know you're my disciples if you have time with prayer every day. All that's good, great. But how they'll really know it is if you and I love people around us and we'll stick out. Why? Because no one's doing that. It's sad. No one's doing that. No one's ever doing that. Other people who are only around people who are only like them. To be a follower of Jesus, to be a lover of people, means you will stick out and people will know there's something special about you. Number three, peacemakers pursue resolution and jerk faces maintain and stagnate. Jerk faces just stay where they are and hunker down where they are. Right here, right now. 
This is one of the uh, reflections I, I published on our, on our app, the Crossroads app. There's a kind of scripture portion. A bunch of us have been doing it, and you can publish your thoughts on it. And I've been having a goal to publish every day on that. And uh, so one of the things that I, I did in my, my quiet time, I just recognized that, you know, we're supposed to be like salt. It's one of the images that are used for us. We're supposed to be like salt. And salt preserves things. And it's also salt is like, you get it? It's like, I need another one. Like I said, it's, it's not possible for me to have only one ruffle potato chip. Not possible. I love ruffles potato chips. I have one, I'm going to have half the bag. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm. I, think, I like to play a little game of snapping it off in, in line with the ridges and turn around and snapping it off again, getting a little, tr- a little rectangle ruffle potato. Anyone else do that in here? Who, who, who's kind of like, yeah, that's good stuff right there. It's fun. Fun eating when you do that stuff, right? This is how we should be with other people. The people should be around us. And we're like salt. We're like ruffles for them. They're like, I just, I just want to be around you. I just, I can't get enough of you because you, you just operate on a different plane, on a different level. It's beautiful. And this is why when Jesus is saying, you do this, first you do this, first you go tell the person. Go tell the person, okay? Tell them. Second, if they don't listen to you at all, take some other people. And we take some other people, the other people might tell you, dude, you're overreacting about this to stop this. Or those other people would say, yeah, you're right, uh, Clarice, we've got to tell you, you're, you, you stink pretty bad. You need to start using deodorant or whatever it is. <laughs> take other people that are then going to talk to the person. And then after that, then there's a high octane thing. If after that, they don't respond, they don't change, not only are they a jerk face, you're supposed to treat them. They are a jerk face at that point. Not only are they a jerk face, you're to treat them like a Gentile or a tax collector. What that means to a Jew in the first century who's trending after God is to recognize, oh, these people just have really hard hearts. This doesn't mean you go, oh, I don't want to be around Gentiles or, oh, I don't want to be around tax collectors. It just means you go, okay, hmm, I categorize them and understand, okay, you're just on a different level than I am. You have a different outlook in life. And so I'm going to stop expecting mature adult behavior from you. I'm going to stop expecting mature, biblically formed attitudes to take place in your life, because obviously you're not interested in that, because I've talked to you about it, other people have talked to you about it, and sometimes when that happens, if it's in the context of a church, then that person may need to be released from their staff job, or they may need to be released from um, a volunteer job, and we do church discipline around here at Crossroads, that happens quite frequently, um, and sometimes someone gets upset about it, because they don't like the process, or don't like this and that, and what do they do when they're upset about it? They go to social media. <laughs> And doesn't, doesn't keep us from saying we want to do exactly the way Jesus would have it to do because this is the way conflict resolution takes place and this is the way love takes place. I deal with, as you do, a lot of jerk faces. So you've got to have as a dealer of jerk faces in your mind how you deal with it. And I'll tell you my four my four step process. What I do. Okay. So the first thing when I'm in and this is I'm closing on this. Okay. So the first thing when I'm when someone's doing something that is bothering me and is really upsetting me, the first thing I do is I, I say to myself, Brian, remember this person's broken. This person's broken. All of us are broken. All of us have issues. All of us, all of us are broken. If you don't think you're broken, let me tell you, you're like incredibly broken if you don't think you're broken. You're broken and don't know it. That's awful. That's the worst. All of us have outages. All of us have blind spots. All of us have, 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 have behaviors that are ingrained in us. All of us have things that are just unright. In the Bible, it's called the fall. It's called sin. It is an infected and affected all of us, all of us are w- way more insecure than we give ourselves credit for. All of us are. And so when someone's done something to hurt me, I got to first go, okay, this is coming out of a place of brokenness in them. Maybe someone close to them died recently. Maybe I unintentionally pressed a button that caused some bad behavior. Maybe, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is, but I just could recognize this person didn't wake up that day and say, hmm, I need to go hurt Brian Tome today. That's what I need to do. That's on my to-do list. No, recognize there's a sense of brokenness there. All of us have. The second thing is practice silence. 
just be quiet. Just like say nothing. Be silent. Be quiet. Most of that interaction I was talking about in the, in the Christmas conflict, most of the interaction I was just like, hmm, listening. Three, ask questions. Ask questions. Now, what do you mean by that? Tell me about the Ask questions. Allow that person to talk. And then four, you talk if you're asked the question. So I wait for a question to come, and I feel the question comes, then, then sort of the door is open to me, and therefore I can speak. You, you've got to have some constitution or something that guides the way you interact with others in the midst of this boiling pot of emotions that we call America. And we want to help you with that this week. We want to give you a challenge every day. If you go to our uh, social media page, you go to Facebook, you go to Instagram, our, our Crosser stuff, we're going to issue a challenge, a non-jerk face challenge every day. We'd love you to take. We'd love you to do. We'd actually love you to share with on social media as you are trying to come against it and do this challenge. I'll, I'll tell you right now in advance what this challenge is. You'll get this on Monday. This Monday's challenge is this. Today your challenge is politeness. Everywhere you go today, you hold the door for everyone. No matter how much of a hurry you're in, no matter how many people it is, you show grace and kindness to others by simply holding the door for them. When's the last time you got up and said, I'm just going to be polite today? That's going to be your challenge for Monday, and we're going to give you one every day, all week. I tell you what, you do these challenges, you allow God to start forming and molding your heart, people are going to know there's something different. And there's something special about you. God, I pray that these words would take root in our minds and in our hearts and the fruit would be in our limbs. The fruit would be in what we say, where we go, and what we hold. Bring our church, every person in this church, every person who's in earshot or eye shot of anything that's been said today to a place to be amazing salt and amazing refreshing water to a bitterly divided culture. Help us to not be a jerk face and to bless those who are. And I pray these things according to the character and identity of Jesus. Amen. All right, let's take those challenges. You have an amazing weekend. We'll see you.